Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, so in the realm of fun things, my talk is about not writing JavaScript in your apps. And I've spent most of this month speaking about JavaScript. Um, and it's what I do in my day-to-day -day job every day. Um, so we're going to talk about Phoenix Live View. Um, first, just a bit about me. Um, I said, my name is Matt LaForest. Um, I presently work, live in Whitmore Lake. Um, if anybody is not familiar with where Whitmore Lake is, you go to Ann Arbor, drive straight north, and you'll run into it. Um, preferably not the lake itself. I wouldn't recommend driving into the lake. It's not that deep, so your car, your car would only be about halfway down. But um, not, a, not the best idea. I work at TED conferences. Um, most of people here, I'd imagine, know who TED is if we're not exactly a small group. Um, I have written code in lots of languages, um, at least five languages professionally. I primarily write JavaScript right now, um, but I bounce between stuff. I'm, I'm finally getting involved in Ruby because that's what we're, our backend stuff is written in, even though I've avoided it for much of the last oh, seven or eight years. Um, I have three kids under the age of six and a dog who's a jerk in addition to my wife who is a saint because she allows me to come and talk at things like this. And I've been gone for three weekends in June, uh, which, you know, it's like, here, take the kids that you've dealt with all week. And now I'm going to go and leave on the weekend too, so I have them more. So best of luck to you. Um, and she hasn't thrown me out of the house yet. Uh, so like I said, I write JavaScript every day. Um, I will tell you everything that is wrong with JavaScript, and I have a pretty deep knowledge of everything that is wrong with JavaScript, because I do it every single day. Um, I'm going to be the one to tell you that JavaScript isn't something that you should completely avoid. There's a lot of stuff out there, that, and it can do a lot of things for you. Um, but there's downsides to JavaScript, especially writing large applications in JavaScript, because JavaScript has a lot of unwieldy pieces to it. And while it's getting better, there's still some difficulties. A few years ago, um, Jose Valim wrote Elixir. And Elixir uh, was somewhat, people would say that it was inspired by Ruby, but I don't know that that's, there's some similarities there. Um, really what it came down to is Jose was very interested in the uh, Erlang VM and wanted to make a syntax that was a little bit easier to him than Erlang was. So he went and wrote a new language. And then Phoenix was built on top of it. And Phoenix is the rails to Elixir, is the best way I can describe it. It is the dominant web framework in the Elixir community. Um, it's awesome. If you have not had a chance to use it, I highly recommend it in spending some time with it. It can do a lot of things. And it works in ways that you're probably not expect, that you probably won't expect, and can handle loads that you probably can't imagine. Um, people have run Elixir servers, uh, Phoenix servers running 2 million simultaneous WebSocket connections, which if you have dealt with WebSockets on a node server or um, most other systems, the idea of handling 2 million concurrent sessions off of a single server is mind-blowing. Um, and they were able to do it, and it wasn't a like nothing app that they did it with. But let's talk about Phoenix Live View. Um, so Phoenix Live View hasn't been around for very long. It was only announced a few months ago, actually. Um, what it does is it enables rich real-time experiences um, with server-rendered HTML. So that, that's the neat thing about what Live View does. And I'm going to show what that means in a minute. Um, so it means that you can have a real-time app. So all of the experiences you get by writing these big JavaScript applications that give rich experiences, real-time feedback to the users without JavaScript. OK, that's a lie. There's still JavaScript. Um, and I'm going to talk about one more detail on that in a second. There's a, about two lines of JavaScript you have to drop in the app.js file that comes out of the box with a Phoenix application to enable this feature. It's not a lot of JavaScript, but it's already written JavaScript that you're just turning on so that it can do these parts for you. So there's a little bits and pieces of it here, but you're not going to be spending your time in JavaScript. But the important thing here is it's not doing some, it's not trying to be like ClojureScript or a number of the other languages that are taking these completely different languages and trying to compile them down to be JavaScript. This still works on the server. 
Um, and we'll talk about that when we talk about some of the caveats about what you can and can't do with this technology. But the real important detail here is people are, you're running this code on the server and it's updating it. Um, who here has worked with Rails? Fair number of people. Rails um, highly touted a thing a few years ago called TurboLinks. And the best way I can describe LiveView is LiveView is TurboLinks on steroids. Um, now, that said, I have used TurboLinks and TurboLinks drive me up the wall. And I think most people who I've worked, who I know in the Rails community, and as I said, I'm not the biggest Rails developer, don't ha necessarily have the highest opinion of TurboLinks. Um, there are places where you, have, you are more than familiar with it though. Um, a lot of GitHub's interface for a long time was actually driven via TurboLinks. That's why you got re these really quick page changes because of how they had built their system to leverage TurboLinks. Um, but what that means, under the hood, what that means is you make a change in LiveView, you do trigger some JavaScript event, and I'll show you the code, what that looks like. It makes a callback to the server, it delivers HTML back, and that HTML gets sh shoved into the DOM where it's supposed to and updates the DOM appropriately. Um, that's the real power of what you're getting here. So let's talk about the whole life cycle here. So you've got our client, the live server, and that's uh, hosted within the, your Phoenix application and then your controller. So Phoenix is a lot like um, Rails or ASP.NET MVC or any of the, your typical MVC frameworks. Um, there's a controller and that's the thing that your client is normally going to talk to. So you trigger off some request um, to get a page, just a standard get request, um, and it goes through and mounts a view from the live server. That first mounting is the thing that then generates HTML for you. That HTML comes back through the controller and gets returned out to the client. And that renders your page, right? Typical lifecycle we're all familiar with here. Where does the live server piece come in? Well, once that page mounts, you get the next step, which you actually get a socket, web socket connection back to the live server from the client. So the client now makes a call all the way back, bypassing the controller to set up a so web socket connection that goes to the live server. And this WebSocket connection is what uh, LiveView is a leveraging to allow you to do the, net, the fun parts. And now you've got this real-time stateful connection, right? So you've got a stateful app on your side with LIN limitations, and I'm gonna show you some of those in a minute, um, that you can now set, have data go back and forth across. So, like this isn't a complicated system that we're talking about here. Essentially, what we're, all we're talking about doing is instead of making the callbacks to the server every single time that goes through the controller and is generating new HTTP requests, what you're doing is just sending the data back, the same HTML you would send from your server under a normal get request to the web server, you're sending back and forth over the WebSocket stuff and then you, leveraging the JavaScript that they've already written to do incremental updates of the DOM on a page that's already rendered. So what does this look like in code? So this is a little washed out because of the lights, but we'll try to cover it. And it's, if you can also look over on the other screen, I know it's a lot, it should be more readable over there. But basically you got your render method on your Phoenix controller and all you do is render out, render out HTML, right? There's nothing fancy about what this HTML is. Now, the big thing you might notice is this Phoenix click thing. And this, what you're setting up here is an event that gets, you're gonna be able to listen to back on the server. And you're gonna say, hey, I'm gonna fire the decrement event or the increment event when they click on these buttons. And then I can also make decisions and say, hey, I'm gonna render here if my value is less than five, I'm gonna render the clock. If my, otherwise I'm gonna render my image and be able to seize that. And we, I'll show you this in just a minute so you can see that I'm not making up, like this is a very simple but real application. Um, the other thing I'm gonna tell you is the, dem the demonstrations I'm going to show today are all baked into the examples that LiveView has on their own site. So you can go and pull these all yourself. There's not like a whole bunch of custom stuff here that you need to, well, he was showing this thing, but what is that? You can go look at these examples. They're pulled directly from there so that you can see them for real. Now, the next step is those increment and decrement events I just talked about, right? You just set up event handlers. 
back in your own code. So this is still within that same live view controller that you have. You say, hey, when I get the increment event, I'm going to get a socket in from the Phoenix provides this to you as part of the structure. And then I'm going to update, call back with the socket, and pass the value in. And all I'm going to do is just bump the increment the number or decrement the number, as the case may be. And that renders back into the other one to show that value where we were saying at val before. That value now is updated and something that I can look at in, when I render the HTML. And then the server will update it. So this is the part that's going to take me two seconds to do. OK, so we're going to start up our, the server. Um, this is starting mix. Uh, Phoenix.server is how you start up the Phoenix web server. As you can see, it takes a really long time to do this once you start it up. So this is the whole example set that I was speaking about, um, which I'll, sh provide, I'll show you the URLs for the live server stuff itself, and they have a link directly to this example set. Um, we were just looking at the counter one. So here's our counter, right? All Keep an eye as we do this on the server, on the stuff. We're never going to see us making a callback to the server again, right? Once this page is loaded, this page is loaded. We have our decrement, our increment, our counter, little clock view, right? It's less than five. So we see the clock view right now. Um, I can bring this up, and the clock view disappears, right? I can scale up. This guy, I can, change him to, I can change the background from white to black. And the important thing here is I'm not making full page renders here. I'm firing off JavaScript events in the background. It's making a call to this. Those JavaScript events are being captured by the Phoenix Live View JavaScript. It makes a callback over the WebSocket connection, which then returns HTML, which is then reinserted into the DOM. OK. <laughs> so like I say, you can see a, a whole, and I'm going to show you a couple other demos from here um, to show you the range of things that you can actually do with something like this. Go ahead. I don't know if this is specific to Phoenix or just these in general, but the big thing we focus on a lot is accessibility. And I don't know how that, by injecting HTML, how things like JAWS and those types of screen readers can deal with it. It's no, so that one I would tell you is, is no different than the accessibility issues you deal with a single page application and the updates that it does to the DOM. Um, it suffers from the exact same set of problems. It's not an unsolvable problem. Um, you do have to pay attention to it, though. I deal with accessibility as well, so I'm not like, I understand where you're coming. Um, if you write a single page web app like within React or within Vue, you have that same problem if you update the DOM after it's already loaded. You have to do something to trigger the screen reader to be aware that that change has happened. Um, this suffers from exactly the same set of limitations there. Um, I'm going to talk about where this technology is um, like in its life cycle in a moment. Um, I don't think that's been well addressed necessarily yet, but that's partially because it's still very early in its like development cycle. Um, but to show you like the range of things that you can do with Live View, this is, everybody knows Snake, right? This is all rendered on the server. Like, full game, can render it on the server. It's perfectly capable of handling this kind of traffic. Right? Um, there are other things that you could do. Uh, and they said there's a list of like all the different examples that they provide that you can kind of get through. There's a Pac-Man example and drawing a rainbow. And like these are all like very simple things to do. And all you're doing is rendering HTML. And rendering HTML, like one of the reasons why uh, you know, our very first speaker to this morning, and I'm sorry, I'm forgetting his name right at the moment, was talking about, hey, AS, you know, ASP and life cycle, uh, web life cycles and all that. And the reason why everybody got away from doing that was because it's really easy to contemplate. I send a request and I get a response back, right? I can make HTML. They ask for this thing. I'm going to return them something that's going to look like the thing that they want. This doesn't change that paradigm from a thought perspective. You're just you deal with an you deal with the event. You update some state on the server for this client, and it's attached to their session. 
and that thing that you just updated on the server, you just render back HTML, and you let this take you let Live View take over and update the DOM for you and show the correct thing to the user on the um, without having to do a full page round trip. You've already got that stateful connection. It's great to say, hey, I've got static st I've got static pages, and I'm just going from one to the next. This allows fully dynamic behavior, which you can't do with straight static pages. But it also gets rid of the handshake thing because you've already established that with the WebSocket connection, which the handshake, if you're aware, is like one of the bigger pieces of overhead in that whole chain of events. There are some limitations here. Um, you need to be able to talk to the server. As, I, as we talked about, I've spent, I did two separate presentations already this month on progressive web apps. That mean, talking to the server means it's not, there's some limitations here in what you have to do. You have to be, have the server available, right? Um, when I talk about progressive web apps, one of the things I make really strong point about saying, hey, you can't do this. You need to think about what if I don't have a connection to the server? The answer to this in this case is if I don't have a connection to the server, this just doesn't work. <laughs> so there's limit. You have to think about what am I trying to build and what are the limits that I have. Um, it's also not necessarily at the moment, and I'll mention this at the very last point on this, the best choice if you need like really smooth animations and all some of those pieces, as large chunks of your screen are changing, it's probably going to be more difficult to write the pieces that you need to do that um, in, a, uh, in an easy to understand way. You're going to be do, jumping through a lot of CSS hoops to probably make that work in a reasonable ma manner. Now, that said, as somebody who writes, writes a lot of React, animations are like one of the biggest pain in the butt things to get working properly anyway. So I don't know that that's necessarily like the be all and end all of whether you should choose to use this or not use it, but just calling it out. Um, you're also gonna up your server resources. One of the like great selling points to like writing JavaScript applications is, hey, guess what? My customers got their own computer and I can use their computer to do to spend and figure out how to do things. And I can now have less on my server. Uh, I can spend less money on my servers to do the same thing. Now, the good news here is Elixir and the Erlang VM are really resource efficient. Remember that 2 million WebSocket connection deal? I don't know if this is a big thing, but it's something to be aware of. Um, it's still immature. Um, it's been, it was originally announced only several months ago. It is still in very early active beta development. Their GitHub repo calls that out. It's like, look, this is something that we're actively working on. Don't necessarily expect that the APIs are not going to change substantively and they're not gonna be like significant changes to the underlying bits and pieces and how they work here. They're still trying to figure out like all the details. From a high end perspective, this works already. Um, just be aware that this is still an evol very rapidly evolving technology. So all that said, where, what might be good fits for this? If you need to do rapid prototypes and you've already got people who are familiar with this, the Elixir Phoenix ecosystem in the first place, this is great, right? I now can like bypass a whole like communication between front end developers and back end developers. I can just rapidly iterate on something. Um, I think this is actually a really great fit for back office applications um, where you would talk about, I actually advocate really strongly in within Ted that we shouldn't be like, we were falling into a trap of writing single page applications for writing the admin interfaces to our um, backend app admin applications, which it's like, wait, we have twice as many Rails developers as we have JavaScript developers. So why are we spending, why are we like heavily involving JavaScript developers in backend stuff that's just fine to have full page reloads? This is like a step of, hey, I can get a very interactive system without having to involve a full page, you know, that whole separate handoff to the JavaScript team in this case. Um, it's also really great, like I said, I advocate strongly when I write PWAs that you need to think about your application working offline, but the fact of the matter is not every, not every web application needs to be able to work offline. If you're building a card playing game that's, a, in, that's supposed to be people playing online cards with one another, there's no expectation that that's going to work offline. So building it on structures that are designed to work offline probably doesn't make sense, and that's okay. 
So if you don't need offline support, again, this might be a really good fit for what you're looking for. Um, if you have a smaller team, this might be a good, right? The more different moving applications you have, the bigger the team, the bigger the number of people that you need to support those pieces and develop them. So if you have a smaller team, this is probably gonna be a good fit. Okay, so let's throw up some resources on where you can go look. Um, Phoenix Live View is all within their GitHub repo right at the moment. So uh, Phoenix Framework, Phoenix Live View. Um, they've got really good instructions on how to do this. I showed you the core code for doing Live View stuff. There are a lot of setup hoops you have to jump through to get your Phoenix application set up to run Live View. There's, you have to install a new dependency and put in routes and a whole bunch of slew of other things. They will walk you through step by step. Those have also changed over time. That's another reason why I don't want like make the slide deck very tightly tied to the uh, structure, the basic structure of how you get Live View set up because a lot of that's in flux right now. Um, the introduction to Live View is from Chris McCord. Um, Chris McCord is the primary author of Phoenix. Um, you can also find uh, YouTube talks of him presenting this and like introducing it for the first time. But that Dockyard uh, article is great. Um, it walks you through the whole process of how it works and all of those pieces. Um, Elixir School is also a very good like resource in general for like learning Elixir. They have another really good one. And then Phoenix and Elixir are, hey, look, if you're gonna do this, it's probably good to know the technology you're building on in the first place, right? Um, Elixir is a little bit different. There's some mind wrapping things you need to do there, um, but it's a great language and I highly encourage everybody, anybody to take the time to learn it because Elixir will make you Elixir will change the way you think about code, especially if you're coming from languages like C Sharp or Java or Ruby even. Um, while some of the syntax is similar, Elixir works in very different ways and there's some, things, there's some valuable things to learn there no matter what. Okay, with that, thanks for letting me go and throw all this, new, throw this stuff at you. Um, I'm more than willing to uh, talk with anybody, uh, give ideas on where I think this is helpful in that. Um, I will be, I will give the one caveat of, I will only be around until lunchtime. Um, unfortunately, my family has uh, plans this afternoon, so I need to get back home. Again, don't want to get kicked out of my house. Um, but thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.